Okay, hi, welcome um, to the third Lesbian All-Star reading. So um, I'm in a state of awe to be reading with Minnie Bruce Pratt, a friend since I shakily approached her many, many years ago at a Randall Keenan reading, and Randall Keenan is a wonderful writer we both love who just passed recently and um, was acknowledged by Lambda Literary just recently as well, who was reading at the Poetry Project um, in 1995. And I was nervous, I was a new writer. And I asked her if she'd be interested in reading at a little tiny organization called Shades of Lavender, which was the woman's space I was working at that was part of the Brooklyn AIDS Task Force. She was so warm and miraculously came to our little space in a different Park Slope it's been luminous to be a reader of her amazing book, Magnified, and to bring her together with Irina Klepfish and to be at the planning meeting where the two of them are in the same room virtual for the first time in many years. A vibrant and relevant and lesbian and activist and brilliant as ever, and to bring Alma and Zoe into this room. We were all are all so happy and to be with you tonight. Um, I thought by way of introduction to this Lesbian All-Stars, I'd acknowledge Rachel Gunn Wilson and James Lou, Loop, <laughs> who shepherded the first one, which was hosted by Sarah Schulman for First Monday's Readings of New Works in Progress at Performance Space New York. The event took place on March 4th, 2019. Rachel and James transcribed this, uh, my introduction for this event and Hugh Lee published it in their Philosophia journal and I'm pulling from it now. So I'm reading a, a half of what I wrote that read that night, uh, said that night, quote, I woke this morning from a dream in which I confronted a powerhouse of a woman, a leftist activist, not someone I actually know from real life who was against the word feminist for its harm and exactitude. I insisted to her that at its core, it was liberatory. What I said to her in my dream was, Quote, feminism means to fight the rude linearity and constraint as what it means to be a woman, end quote. Well, ideally, or maybe that is the thing it means, one thing it means. I've been dwelling on what I would say about the word and the identity category of lesbian and why I wanted to be blatant and name an event lesbian all-stars. Once again, like naming Belladonna series Belladonna accidentally probably subliminally gliding against the language material of pornography or public sex while doing something else, if not entirely other than what it is. I'm rereading Sherry Morega and Amber Halabaugh's conversation, what we're rolling around in bed with, and want to say at bottom for me, it was this, that when I was ro once romantic with a cis man and hibernating in order to not offend or confuse, most of all, my own sense of the meaning of the word lesbian, I grieved over the loss literarily and politically of how personally I rely on what I roll in bed with to build myself politically, literarily. Does lesbian insinuate an essentialist category? Does it exclude, does it hearken from an idea that becomes universal via planetary colonial webbing? I think so. And yet these webs, those webs, can they be useful and conversant with decolonialized, decolonialized and non-binary forms of expressive bodily resistance? I was having a conversation with Raquel Gutierrez last night and we talked about the potential capaciousness of the word. And that's all I'll read from that. So what is it, three years old, two years old introduction. So now I welcome you to the third iteration of Lesbian All-Stars formally, wearing the shirt. I don't know if you can see it, but I'll, I'll stand up. James, is, James and I are geeking out wearing the shirt together. <laughs> designed by Rachel Wilson, thrilled to be part of it myself as a poet and about the broadsides designed by artist Bill Mazza, who's in the room, who has long been our friend, long, long, really has been doing the Belladonna work since 2001, I think, um, and is also Minnie Bruce's good friend for a long time. And it goes on and it's a snake and it's a circle. And here as part of that circle are Zoe and James who will tell us how the hour will go. Um, I guess, wait, are you, James, aren't you? I think you're going first to do a little news. Okay, very good. Yes, I am. 
Yeah, so this is our, this is my madcap, whatever I remember of, of what our news is, um, which is that this is the last event of the season and it's been a lovely season. Um, we just had, we've had a sort of sub-series called Influx um, and I, I, th I think that's been going won wonderfully. We had a really, the last one was really interesting and lively. Um, and you know for for all the events we have chaplets available on the website um and we've been in the process of um digitizing and making available all of the out of print chaplets um so please please check those out on the on the belladonna site um and we have beautiful broadsides um available like for the event tonight uh and those those should go up tomorrow is that Yes, I think so. So these, these along with the, the recent books, um, I think the last one was uh, Simone Kearney's Days um, are all available on the site. I'm just, I'm just shilling right now. So thank you for bearing with me. But it is, um, you know, as, as I'm sure all of you know, um, small presses are largely a labor of love and dedication and, um, but you know, are also a thing that needs your support. So it's a great time to subscribe uh, to Belladonna, which you can also do on our site um, and get these lovely materials uh, and also support the ongoing work of uh, curation and publication and circulation and um, slow whale-like uh, percolation. Um, <laughs> And then I think, uh, what else is happening? Something to watch out for is uh, Montez Press Radio, uh, which has been doing lots of really interesting stuff, is going to do a full rebroadcast of the marathon reading that Belladonna co-hosted with Night Boat in celebration of the republication of Akila Oliver's, uh, the, the She Said, oh, there's another word at the end of that title. Dialogues. Dialogues, thank you. Um, so that's going to be coming up. Uh, links, links for all of these things are going to shortly be in the chat so you don't have to remember my rambling. Um, I, think, I think that's it in the way of news. Um, and I'll just pass it on over to James who will uh, introduce our first reader for tonight. Yeah. Hi. I'm James Loop. I do coordinating work here for Belladonna. I'm the only one who has the broadside. Everyone has to talk about the broadsides without being able to show you them, but I can show you the broadsides, which are very beautiful. Designed by Bill Mazza. Thank you, Bill. And printed by our neighbors here, Middle Press. They're lovely letterpress, um, kind of burgundy lettering, one for each of our readers tonight. Um, and they're gorgeous. I highly recommend you get them. They're not yet listed on the site, um, but if you PayPal us, and I'm putting the address in the chat now, somewhere between 12 and $12 million, sliding scale, your choice, um, we'll send you the set. Uh, just make sure that your address is current in your PayPal information so we know where to get them out to you. Um, we'll think of it as a little season ending fundraiser um, to help us go sail into the summer and relax a little bit um, here at Belladonna. Um, thank you, Zoe, for handling the news. I, I think I can think of nothing to add. But yes, it is a great time to subscribe. We had a really full, um, beautiful season, and there's eight or nine chaplets that we'll put in the mail next week to our subscribers. So um, this is the moment. I am here to introduce Alma Valdez Garcia, which is exciting for me um, because Alma started um, working with me here in the Belladonna studio, actually where I presently am. Oh, I, I also have the t-shirt on, I can show you that. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, and um, it's been really fun to watch Alma grow through um, sort of intern level tasks up now to a kind of um, featured artist. We like to emphasize at Belladonna that our um, staff is poets, right? We're all poet run. 
here comes Rachel Wilson now, <laughs> incidentally. <laughs> where Rachel did the t-shirts. <laughs> Hi. I'm also on the phone watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Belladonna is poet run. Art workers are often creators and we want um, everybody to know that. And we try to sing that full loud um, in, our, in our programming, including in the staff chaplet, which is number 266, where you can read another poem of Alma's as well as work by Zoe and myself and the other uh, Belladonna volunteers. Um, and I took a page out of Alma's book who when they do introductions uh, writes a golden shovel based on a line um, from the poet that they like, or I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, uh, the poet that they have invited to read. Um, and I chose the last line of Alma's poem from the staff chaplet, which has been clanging around in my head ever since I read it, which is, <clears throat> Fuck the West and feed the rest. And I wrote a short poem um, around that line for Alma. Also been very inspired by Alma's work in um, food, which maybe you can read more about, um, but was something that is personally inspiring to me is people who take one foot in poetry and step the other in a seemingly different direction and then suddenly make the two things seem like one thing. Um, so, Here's my golden shovel for Alma. Who's to say, or give even, a truce, a fuck, the dump truck careering around inside, the castle idea peeped through the fetters of the west of me, of we will make short work and smite it joyously thus. If you could feed yourself through that, through all that, the numinous harvest speaks the rest. Alma Valdez Garcia is a Latina poet and cook based in Queens, New York by way of New Mexico. They focus on the dreamscape as a way of imagining a new future through food, care, and pleasure. They look at how bodies transform with the land in our site and other spaces. Currently, they are in the process of pursuing a community herbalist certificate with the People's Medicine School, seeking ways of growing plants and thyme in the city and getting ready for a summer of endless pickling and solar light. Yes, rock and roll. Okay, so without further ado, here comes Alma. Thank you so much, James. <laughs> I love the golden shovel. Um, they are definitely a classic. So I really appreciate you putting the time into that. It was amazing. Um, and thank you for asking me to come and read for this um, and to be a part of the launch for Minnie Bruce's book, um, Magnified. It feels really special and it feels very apt to where we are now. Um, kind of in a flow of coming out of the last year and still in it, but trying to reimagine new things. So I'm really excited to be doing that. Um, so I'm actually going to be starting off reading some poems from Magnified. Um, not too many. I want to just give a little preview for, <laughs> for everyone so that you can go buy the book after this. Um, but I'm going to start with that and we'll see where we go. Um, so this is a poem, Blue Moon. The trees creak overhead, squeaky doors pushed forth and back in the wind. On the porch, we watch the moon rising from whisper to guess to peach, white, and then blue. Once in a blue moon, a love like this comes along. We weren't standing alone. Lots of people, a room vast with politics and that ex-lover playing catch my eye. You read us a story, the one who had been you, a past, the one who had been me, your torn shirt, my needle's eye. We had been alone. We had read what the other had asked. The light shone on the pages, your face tilted up in the glare. Glory, mere future. Later, I knew you were looking up at me. I knew you, you knew me. We looked at each other, shining on each other, shining on sun, sailing on moon. And I'm gonna do one more for y'all. Um, and like, there was just such like a touching, just like sense of vastness that I felt in all of these and just a sense of kind of like longing for us to like imagine something more. So it's kind of felt like those tied into my own work in a lot of ways. These poems spoke to me. <laughs> all right, licked. 
The people we were, the people we are now. The apple blossoms blown, flowers fallen, blight biting into every leaf, skin scaling on the trunk and branches, skeletal shadows on the walk as I pass, grieving and loving this bony, brittle world that breaks and opens day after day. The bees gnawing at the red-hearted rose of Sharon, licked, sticky all over from flower tongues, pollen bristle, until it's, too, it's hard to tell flower from bee, the insect from tree, me from you, you from me. Uh, go buy the book, <laughs> it's amazing. You won't regret it. Um, and I'm gonna read some of my own work uh, now. Um, hopefully it won't take too long. But um, yeah, just a lot of my own work just like focuses on, it's been all written last year actually, um, and kind of trying to imagine a new way of being um, the work of imagining, with the work of dreaming, all the things that kind of are necessary and kind of getting out of the, the break in the world we're in now. Uh, so I'm gonna read the poem that is currently on your rep rod side, so you'll be able to find it yourself. Uh, and I'll start. Carrie, from that living, abolition begins. We become abundance. We present our scorched body for work. We are given warped scarcity, so the ones that keep hands never have to give a hand. Future greediness, kill the idea. Perform exertion. Build up protection roots because we can't trust anyone to do it for us. To hear care is sex. Repeating labor for life sustains our recoil. Remember, we are never only hungry. Work days carry us to imaginary school, pipelines of blood debt. Fuck transaction nationalism. If the banks call, tell them we're busy capturing our futures of dismantling and purging in the eyes of the sun. Breathing strays from our lives until it breaks the change we feel explode. Our fruits of labor, we watch things burn down, count seeds and get ready to plant them down for they are better than we ever will be. This continual resurfacing of spitting soil is society's rivering days. What dreams have structure when it's transactional? Freedoms are hands to be planted, requiring care to keep shape. All flourishing is mutual. Bodies of labor don't consider this survival life. Let structures crumble when we tell them to see me take my pleasure back and shape it like a dream re recreating desire, dream bombing. Freedom begins in the mind, unconscious through sense and sustaining, fungus of calling, which keeps dreams needing us. God bless us, God bless us, we are one. Thank you. And I'm gonna read one more. Um, I hope it's not gonna be going over too much, um, but this kind of follows in the same, kind of the same frame as everything else. Um, the care that's necessary and the care of just being with one another. Flood, fill full with care. Our ancestors know strength while toxicity creates money mind. Will the world fill through dye matter? Before our creation, come of water, in being, inhaling caregivers, allow a break, a heal. We of woods, the without, footstep bodies, lifeblood that could land home. We must be one in blood, iron people, control light. Take eroded wood. In my world, they that return a future flee. We the full-bodied flourish. In our being, we fear in ways of ourselves. Stomp shafts silent, become destroyer. Oxygen lives whichever way leaves deers amongst mud. Let same be. We are chemical, always competition. Show futurity, flee youth, breathe without having to intake, bear, share bones, bay for life, break. Deers of blood sink nature in a world of always have, can mind, body, water, land, tell all that holds future. This contaminated epicenter has always been radioactive. In finality, many dreams carry light. Grandmothers feel rest of bones when place is always theirs. To be of land, our destroying nature now gone. Deer's future, the generous, grows half to life.
Um, that's all. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> um, thank you again for having me. Just feel really special and honored to be here. Um, and we'll pass it on to the next amazing readers for the rest of the night. <laughs> so I'm actually next. I'm I I have so many hats tonight. <laughs> So I thought um, I would forgo an introduction since I've sort of introduced myself by introducing Lesbian All-Stars, but I'm so excited to be a part of this. Minnie Bruce and I acknowledge that we had never read together. So this is really, truly a delight. And Alma, that was gorgeous. It's really wonderful to read with you too. I mean, Alma has been in my life for a few years now too. And this is just such a special and of course, incredible to read with Irena. So I'm going to read more. Um, I just want to again lift up the book and show you how beautiful it is. Um, it's a really uh, there's there's a theme of water all throughout and wave and blue. And I didn't realize that I was also reading um, a poem of blue. So, but more from the back of the book. It's called. I'm going to read two. The first one's called All in the Blue. This is from Minnie Bruce Pratt, Magnify. After months, after almost death, after almost nothing left of life before, I get to the corner garden and on a bench, there's a shattered shell gnawed to pieces, a black walnut and green husks unhoused. Its valves halved and hollow where the nut meat once grew sweet. Bees are bumbling in the borage. Yes, like that, all in the blue as the cloud shadows pass over the broken particles on the blue bench. The wind shadows still pass over the river and over its stone tooth rapids at the ferry crossing, even when I'm not there. I say, memory, come in, come in river. No, I'm not happy. No, I'm not hopeful for myself. I can't see where to go. But the sun equinoctial and even handed leans down on my side. The wind also and the wind shadows. Field of vision test. Center, periphery, sparkles, I set my eyes to catch. On my scrim of memory, we move again, drive miles to the darkest spot and lie down in the cold. The sky wrinkles as we look up and see fiery tears in the night. We let the stars fall down on us for hours. The fire in us leaps up to meet debris disintegr disintegrated into light. Smoke trails, swarms of meteors, be flights of light in our eyes, oblique sight that after image lingers. The destroyed glory, the speckled dust of the universe still falls on us as the implacable day advances ray by ray. Um, and I'm gonna read a couple of my own poems, but I just wanna say, um, I did have the delight of blurbing this book. And one of the things I said about it is that it imagines a revolutionary afterlife, which I'm still sort of absorbing the meaning of that and it's truly profound. And I just, um, so in some ways, I, I think Minnie Bruce was curious about why we picked the poems we did, but for me, so those two poems also pointed to that. I, I too, am gonna read the poem that has come to life again through being made into this gorgeous broadside. I don't know, James, if you wanna show the broadsides. Um, this one's, uh, these are from a series called Against Travel and almost all the poems are called Against Travel and this, and they're all for somebody and this one's for Sabine, Sabine Maher to be exact. The arrow points right, but the board upon which it's been drawn tilts northeast toward a flat 11 a.m. on a space sundial of the mind. I go down the escalator only to be told by a second sign the exit I seek is up. I wanna let Bug know it wasn't cynical, Sabine's remark about the ampleness of love and youth turned apparently scarce past 50, in which, which in women is menopause, a word according to Abigail, and I don't disagree, is unequal, so a difficult object for a poem. No matter, let's return to that abundance turned into snapshot, not a fragment nor a shard. Sabine's once so much, now so little, I loved her exclamation. I pictured just how much, how plump things were, once were. I just went off. Am I still on? Okay. Oh, <laughs> there I'm reading it. Okay, sorry. Um, I was reading the computer, but now the computer's all my, my broadside. 
Um, no matter, let's return to that abundance, turn into snapshot, not a fragment nor a shard. Sabine's once so much, now so little. I loved her exclamation. I pictured just how much, how plump things once were. They don't stay plump. And with what had they been so inflated? Sabine calls it love. Baby girl and Franklin died in front of me after a slow decline that was defining, not horrifying. I watch a beautiful man and a beautiful woman. They like it. They watch back. The three of us simultaneously aging, all right. I don't always hate a heterosexuality. The birds here were eviscerated a while ago, consumed by the hunger and the hunt, and who knows what else. Mallory complained to me about the house cats eating songbirds. I vacated him a songbird vacating a fly. Suddenly everyone runs to the window squealing over arrival, flock of gulls, lavash, cries Suzanne, and I run too, looking for a cow. My mother bests 55 years of despisal telling me I've made it. What the fuck, where? Up the up escalator to the Eurostar. So much speed, so little light. So um, I wanna end there. Um, I'll get to talk more later in my third hat of being in a conversation. Thank you so much. Um, I realized we didn't tell you all the orders, so I'm just going to say uh, in the middle what the order is of the night. So we have had our introductions. We've had our first reader, amazing Alma, amazing Rachel. And now we're going to turn to the amazing Irena Kleffish, who I'll also introduce. Then we will introduce Minnie Bruce, who will give a reading. And then we will have some time for conversation amongst ourselves and some um, audience via chat from the audience, hopefully, um, if, if I keep on moving it along. As, I, as we're doing a good job. Um, Zoom is amazing, but we, we recognize that it's not quite as abundant as being uh, in the room all together. Um, but thank you so much, James, for putting that up. Okay, uh, Arena. Well, thank you. I'm gonna introduce you, Arena. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Formally gonna introduce you, yeah. So Arena Kleffish is a lesbian, a secular Jew, a poet, a teacher, activist, a Yiddish translator, um, who came to New York at the age of eight. She's a founding editor of Conditions. She co-edited The Tribe of Dina, a Jewish women's anthology, a founder of the Jewish Women's Committee to End the Occupation. She taught Jewish studies at Barnard College and women's studies at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. The author of A Few Words in the Mother Tongue, poetry, her new poetry manuscript is titled Her Birth and Later Years. And um, we are being brief is what I wrote in our introduction. So I will just say that when Julie Enzer, the amazing Julie Enzer, who's for me always here because she also brings so much of this together of sinister wisdom and a poet herself and a scholar who brought us the collected Pat Parker. Anyway, no Julie Enzer, if you don't already know Julie Enzer. Uh, when she brought Irena's new manuscript, her birth and later years to my attention for reading, I had this experience um, and sense of reading about how trauma is experienced as quotidian and normal and how we exist both as ourselves and outside of ourselves, even the, in the middle of the horror, which certainly some of us face more than others, but one can say we all now face all the time. Her work, I am certain, will carry me through this present and future, and I am so honored to have her here tonight. Well, thank you, Rachel. That's really, <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you for including me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm particularly happy. I want to just say before I start reading Minnie Bruce's um, wonderful work that this book just physically is amazing. I mean, everybody should buy this. This is what I consider almost a perfect creation for a poetry book. I mean, the photograph of Water by Leslie is just so moving and to have it repeated almost rhythmically through the book is just breathtaking to me. I mean, to me, this book represents a total merging of content and form. I mean, that it so much embodies the poetry, you know, Minnie Bruce's poetry and words. There's a physicality about it. And I have to say that this book kind of confirms my total attachment to physical books because I mean, eBooks are great and they're economical and you can schlep them on when you're traveling, but in your little phone, but there's nothing like this book. So I encourage everybody who's here to buy it because it's really, really gorgeous. So, okay, I'm gonna read three poems of <laughs> Minnie Bruce, or maybe if I, I have enough chutzpah, I'll read a fourth one. Um, and then I'll read one poem of my own. This is called First Person Here. 
I am making fake parentheses with my feet on the park's white surface of unfolded snow. I am making a trail, first person here after dawn. I am watching for what is here I can save. Trillions of slight periods of snow are ellipsing, eclipsing everything. But when I look down, I see others here before me, squirrel, dog, human. The first is never the first. With what with evolution and six million years of us making our mark on whatever we can on frozen water that will melt. Now a trace of this walk is in you who are reading in your ear and memory, the nut hatch roughly peeping. This next poem is called Some Someone is Up. Among the snow boulders on this block before dawn, one heavy coated person walking in the road, a man coughing, two children waiting for the school bus, two houses with weather stripping and no siding, two with blue tarps and no roof, two for rent signs. On this street, workers are living behind what's left, opulent facade of another century, the stained glass veneer of lavender, yellow, blue. Someone is up in the subdivided houses, the black metal envelopes of mailboxes counting two, four, eight apartments. Four more houses boarded up, three empty and one dead last has plywood nailed over the bottom windows. But on the second floor, lights come on Someone is up in the half condemned house. The snow counts up as tall at the, as talk show pundits say, things are better. Here we see the bust after every boom that means our jobs and lives are exploding. The dust settling like snow on our shoulders and like cement around our feet. And this third poem, The Gulls Cry. Overhead, the gulls cry, how, how? And yes, I know it's me making meaning in their voice. They are not amazed at the maples overnight twirling their red tassels in the wind. They are not dismayed that gray clouds inundate the blue future of the sky. It's me. Only me trying to rejoice three days after snow vanished everywhere from the ground, from these palms, as the nibs of grass green the brown, ready to begin their story again, even as I stand and look down at the muddy ground, unable to imagine how I will go on without you. I'm just going to read one poem. It's, it's, um, it's titled called Fadl Stuck, who was a Yiddish poet, who was an immigrant at the turn of the 20th century, came to the United States. She was a Yiddish poet, and unlike other Yiddish-speaking uh, immigrants, she also tried to write in English and found it not, did, was not very successful about it. And um, I was interested in that as someone who um, would try to adapt to a new language after having been raised in a different one. She was, um, at the time that I wrote the poem, she we thought that she had died in a mental institution. We found out later, I found out later through the work of various scholars that that wasn't true, but the poem, I think, just stands. It's called Fadlstok and it's her speaking. And it's got the epigraph from the Polish um, poet Czesław Milosz. He was in exile here in the United States at the time that he said this language is the only homeland. They make it sound easy some disjointed sentences, a few allusions to mankind. But for me, it was not so simple, more like trying to cover the distance from here to the corner or between two sounds. Think of it, home and home, the meaning the same, of course, exactly. But the shift in vowel was the ocean 
in which I drowned. I tried, I did try, first held with Yiddish, but you know, it's hard. You write gas and street echoes back, no resonance. And let's face it, memory falters. You try to keep track of the difference like Gott and God or Hoys and house, and they blur and you start using alley when you mean Gessele or Avenue when it's a boulevard. And before you know it, you're on some alien path, standing before a brick house, the door frame slightly familiar. Still, you can't place it exactly. Passes by stop, concerned they speak, but you've heard all this before, the vowels shifting up and down, the subtle change in the guttural sounds, and now it's nothing more, nothing more than babble. And so you accept it, you're lost. This time you really don't know where you are. Land or sea, the house floats before you. Perhaps you once sat at that window when it was home and looked out on that street or Gessela. Perhaps it was a dead end, perhaps a shortcut, perhaps not. A movement by the door, they stand there beckoning, mouths open and close, come in come in. I understood it was a welcome. A dunk. A dunk, I said, till I heard the lock snap behind me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. That was incredible. I, now I think um, we're going to turn to Zoe, who is going to introduce Mini Bruce. Yeah, um, this has all been so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, I typically am of the word salad school of introducing, um, but I actually wrote a little introduction, <laughs> uh, so I'll just I'll just read that. Um, so yeah, my name is Zoe Tuck. Uh, it feels relevant to say in a reading like this that I'm a lesbian trans woman, uh, poet from Austin, Texas. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce Minnie Bruce Pratt. Um, I don't actually have the new book, so I've been revisiting her work um, through, uh, well, <laughs> speaking of ebooks, I have I have the ebook of uh, she slash he. Um, and then also I, I checked out uh, Rebellion and Crimes Against Nature. Um, and, um, but I was, I was starting to percolate on She, uh, which is Pratt's 1995 collection published by Firebrand. Um, and I was thinking about the way this work has endured uh, for almost 30 years since its publication and, and how that speaks to both Pratt's literary craft and the timelessness of the way desire to know others and ourselves um, opens up a space of question. Um, and the following passage from Gender Quiz, the piece that starts the book shows Pratt's generosity in opening that space, not just for herself, but for others. Um, and it's always weird to quote someone to themselves, but I'll just do that now. Um, so this is the passage that struck me. No one had turned to us and held out a handful of questions. How many ways are there to have the sex of girl, boy, man, woman? How many ways are there to have gender from masculine to androgynous to feminine? Is there a connection between the sexualities of lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, between desire and liberation? No one told us the path divides and divides again in many directions. No one asked how many ways can the body's sex vary by chromosomes, hormones, genitals? How many ways can the gender expression multiply between home and work, at the computer and when you kiss someone, in your dreams and when you walk down the street? No one asked us, what is your dream of who you want to be? Um, no one asked me either, <laughs> but writers like Pratt emboldened me to start asking myself and to take my answers seriously. Um, and as a fellow poet, it has been all the more delightful and emboldening to read Pratt's answers to her own questions and see how they aren't schematic, didactic, or programmatic, but rather dripping with eroticism. I'm thinking right now of the poem Peach. <laughs> uh, 
Um, uh, they're attentive to the mysteries of word and world and attuned to the call of justice. Um, and in uh, revisiting her work, I was also looking at the essay, uh, Poetry in a Time of War, and thinking about how, unfortunately, uh, we're still in a very similar time of war, uh, wars of extraction going on outside the US, and then within the US, uh, anti-Black police violence and a spate of anti-trans legislation, much of which targets children. Um, so I think that there's something um, beautiful and important in, in having a sustained elaboration of a life, you know, meaningfully and deliberately lived, um, you know, in sacred <laughs> union uh, with other people and also in resistance. Um, so please welcome uh, Minnie Bruce Pratt. Thank you so much, Zoe. You can hear me okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, helping us bridge time with that introduction. Um, I'm, I'm just full of joy that we're having an intergenerational lesbian uh, poetry fest tonight. Um, I, Irene and I were talking about this briefly uh, on our tech check. When we when we started when we started our particular journeys, I, you know, I certainly had no idea that this would be happening. The individual imagination is not adequate. It took collective imagination to get us all here together, and it's. Um, I'm just so appreciative of being able to be here with you. And many thanks to the Belladonna crew of all sorts, doing all kinds of different work. I've been there. I certainly know how much work it takes to put something like this together and also to keep everything going over the over time. Um, Irena has been there too. When we started out with the early lesbian magazines. I was with Seminary, she was with Conditions, um, the kind of physical labor it takes to make the books and magazines and get them out to people. So when I say that I'm very appreciative of the Belladonna work, I mean, I mean it because I've, been, I've done it and I know how much labor and time it takes. So Thank you for doing the work that got us all here together. A special thanks to Rachel, who I've known for so long. And, you know, we've talked about poetry while we had pedicures together. So, <laughs> yeah, and lots of other things, you know, Rachel, Rachel was part of giving giving a book party for me, another book party for me once. But anyway, Shades of Lavender, I remember the very moment I walked up the steps to that little bookstore and how wonderful it was to be there. Um, so being here with Belladonna is such a continuation of things that, that I've done and that we've all been doing. I think it's really easy to forget in the middle of the press of horrors and oppression and truly, dreadful things that keep happening. I think it is easy to forget how much we have salvaged and not, and more than salvaged, how much we've loved, how much beauty we have brought into the world, how much friendship. Um, I think we forget that we've changed the world. We've changed it. Even though they keep fighting back, but you know, it's a rear guard action on their part. To all of you, um, 
I'm going to read. I, I, I actually had hoped to hear more of you all's work, and I tried to pressure you into reading more of your own work, but I can see unsuccessfully. So, but I, I am going to read. I'm going to read. I have a little plan here. I'm going to read from my work for about a little over 10 minutes. And all I want to say about the book, I agree with Irena. It's a beautiful book. The, the design people at Wesleyan just were did a marvel with it. Um, and the poems came because while Leslie was ill uh, the last few years, she was ill for a very long time, but um, she was very ill uh, from 2007 on. And I, I tried to take time every day when I wasn't with her to go out and walk. And um, I just was trying to find something to hold on to, to keep going. And some fragment of the world to hang on to that uh, could be a world that Leslie and I were living in together. And those are those that that work. Uh, I, I was working on poems while I was doing that. I mean, that was the walking and the thinking about and, and the and the framing poems they became this book. So, um, and this is starts about, I'm gonna start about in the middle of the book. The tornado. You and I saw the storm coming up the valley. It made a precipice and from there it fell on us. At the storm edge, a couplet of wind fragments side by side inbound and outbound velocities tried to clasp each other. Then a whirl into oblivion, the only evidence of existence, a cloud of debris, beauty into nothingness. You say, let's step back from the window. You clasp my hand. What will be left of us? Bits of sound and matter exhorting voices inside the whirlwind saying the end is not destruction, saying two is not the answer, saying revolution is bigger than both of us. Revolution is a science that infers the future presence of us. magnified. I bend over the cobbled verge, the used for nothing now edge, except to make the little glints insignificant that catch my eye. The first flowers, smaller than this S, smaller than this word, pink jaws, blue bow, white knives, and if I had my pocket lens to swivel out and magnify what I could see, then I would see us. Inside the quiet rooms you almost never leave now, us bending over the table, touching the painted wooden eggs you gave me last spring, the white seed dots, the cross-hatched grass, golden yellow, the outstretched blooms embossed in red, blue, yellow, green. You and me rolling the spring back and forth in our hands, the silver mist outside. The next day we can't see inside. Sweet sweat. East along the line of apple trees on holly, the skin of the petals translucent in the sun early, the body and arms of the trees gleaming through. I come closer and press my nose into the blossoms, the fragrance of your skin, faint sweet sweat, as if salt and all the minerals of the earth are called 
up into you and alchemized by you, breathing out through every pore what you've lived, your love, your chemistry, your history, the smell of your skin. Do not seek to remain. I'm reading Marks in the Eastwood McDonald's. Fleetwood Mac is singing. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Marx is saying, do not seek to remain in something formed by the past, but in the absolute moment of becoming. The words are ripping up the moment and I fall into a tomorrow without you. No morning, no night, no sleeping, no waking, no dawn on your shoulder talking about what is the present. How do I go on the way yesterday, a tree shook its small crescents of seed, angled for planting, sickled for reaping red in the blue sky, the answer in things, not words. But I yearn to talk to you without end about what makes that beauty and what that beauty makes of us. Hargrove Shoals. The habit of living taken away, the green chalked with white dust, like grief, like death on the way to the river. To lose a person like you who can say the eternal nature of changing matter, who longs to go ahead to see who will be on earth in a year, in a million years. The sun opens and breathes out the rapids, breathes out, out. The river breathes in so quietly, I can't hear. To lose a person like you who can say the terrible beauty. If you were here, you'd see how the coal dust rhymes the river edge in black sand. You'd see the lump lunged miners drinking beer in the shade, panting for their breath. The people who just drove up, their child runs down to the worn shoals broad as a spillway and says, we can wade in the shallows or maybe shadows. Everything is in motion. The leaf shadows hurry. Everything is in motion here at Hargrove Shoals. The wind begins to make its afternoon way down the river. The child counts to see how many times. 53 times there is no before and no after. Eternal nature of changing matter, the terrible beauty. The cabbage butterfly. The human brain wants to complete the poem too easy, bored, the poem too hard, angry. What's this one about? Around the block, the easy summer weather, the picture puff clouds adrift in the blue sky that's no paint by numbers. In the corner garden, the cabbage butterfly bothers the big leafy heads trying to complete its life cycle by hatching a horned monster to chew holes in the green cloth manufactured so laboriously by seed germ from air, water, light, dirt. There's no end to this. Yes, no end. Even when we want to stop, 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 even when someone else calls us monster, even when we fear 
and hope that we will not have the final word. Sleeve. I lie in the dark, listening to a pulse of sound, letters in an unknown alphabet spelling out words that come and go through a sorrowful. And out of the corner of my eye, I glimpse you passing down the dim lit hallway, the edge of you your sleeve, perhaps. Closed. The treading, the treadle of work, the going back and forth between what is and what could be. Me trying to keep up. Before dawn, but warmer today and rainy, so this poem's coat is mottled and splotched as first light shows through its thin cover, pulling that over you as you say from your sleep, go out and live. I go, I leave you inside your pain brocaded skin, the skin draped in sweat. Every morning you wake up clothed in pain, at night, there's no taking that off to put on a sleeve of poetry, no buttoning you up safe with one more murmured word. That won't work. In the end, what is left to say in the end you died and with your last mouthful of breath, you carried away the person you had been. You took away the person I was with you. At the end, you said, this time I know I am going and you are staying. But someone unknown to me was the one who survived saying, if only, if only we were still alive. The forward. How we have to go over and over things, repeat beaten path, repeat to bury or uncover the same story told to the same person again, again, again. Yet another of these poems about death. Yes, again. Survival by repetition, the effort behind the smell of cut grass, the swing back, the push, the crisscross of dying blades, you and me, Lying down on the grass after that long, hot march, hand in hand on the cool ground, and then pain, our muscles ceased to the bone. We almost can't get up, but we do. Pain and the body's memory, the going on of all the other marches, the forward. And this is the last poem, and it's the last poem of the book. At the beginning. At the beginning, when you were sick, we stood at the edge of the vast escarpment, the sudden drop off toward what we did not know. The snow on our faces, the snow crystallizing out of nothing as it met us and the granite flint hitting our eyes and mouths, ice clouds slipping through our fingers, melting from present into past. And yet the hope we took in that cold view cast far 
beyond us. Thank you. Thank you for letting me read those to you. Thank you. Thank you, Minnie Chris. Um, we have some time for a conversation um, and we thought we'd start with um, questions from the readers to the readers and maybe beginning with questions to Minnie Bruce. I know I have one that I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about for a while, but I wonder Alma, if you would like to start in the order of us as readers. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, it was just so amazing to like actually get to like hear the, um, to hear the work I'd been like, I've been like reading over the book for so many, so many weeks that to, like actually be able to like hear it as, as it's spoken was really special. Um, for me, just like, like throughout it, there's just a sense of like, a sense of kind of like openness to like seeking, um, like not even answers because like in like mourning and like in like death, there's like, there's no answers. So like, I guess my question is just like, what was that sense of like, like you said that you had this sense of like needing to go out for walks, like while you're writing this book and like, how did that influence like what you were seeing? Like the importance of like walking and the importance of dreaming and the importance of like imagining, like how did all those things kind of like inform inform the book and inform your um your, like journey through like, like putting that like out onto the page it's kind of a question yeah. in place but uh <laughs> <laughs> no no <laughs> it's however it's, you feel at best <laughs> no no it's a it's a really good question because i have to say more than anything i've ever written i mean if not surprisingly um I wrote these to, to survive. I mean, it's not an exaggeration, right? It's not, they weren't, they weren't an idea, right? They were, we were facing something really difficult. Um, that illness was not like so many really serious illnesses. There, there are a lot of ups and downs, a lot of maybe this, maybe that, you know, and suffering. And, um, and meanwhile, work, work, we worked, Leslie and I just worked all the time when she was sick. We were, work I mean, I had a job, but it wasn't just I think you might be frozen a little bit. A little fr frozen. Let it take <laughs> death. It just kept getting closer. Right. Fun, swirly, going. Yeah, my. Am I doing okay now? Just a time out because just the the connection is not not working right now. Just give it a minute to reconfigure itself. To re re catch up. <laughs> You were saying, Minnie Bruce, when it became a little fuzzy, you were talking about how you and Leslie worked yeah. mm -hmm. and worked. That's where things got a little fuzzy. Yeah, I'm going to try not to move around too much. And I went out to try to find something every day to hold me in the world, really, with Leslie with her you know um and what what happened was of course pieces of that world are in the poems the what I found but also I really had to confront in a way as a poet and I'm I'd be interested in if Irene has any thoughts on this because of her work I really had to confront the limits of what words could do. I, they weren't gonna save Leslie. 
So some poems like the cabbage butterfly poem, you know, reflect that and the sleeve. And uh, it, so it was like, well, I'm a poet, but what good is that? And of course I'm an activist too, but I did come to understand because I was trying to save myself with the poetry. I did come to understand that poems can help us stay alive. Like just fundamentally that they can do other things too, but they can make us want to stay alive. So it's fairly strange to have them be. There's a way in which I feel almost like they're shut up in a box in the book. You know, it's a beautiful book, but the distance between why they came into being and them being in the book is so far. It is so far. Like being here with you is really close to what, their work, you know, the work that they did for me and might do for other people, right? That's close. But on a page in a book, it, they're so closed. I mean, I'm happy they're in the book, but the experience of, of you know. I'm going to move it to Irena, especially yes. since since um, you pointed out a certain query that you're both having. Um, so, Irene, if you wanna. Well, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's sort of interesting because I, um, Leslie and Judy died in the same year, 2014. And Judy was sick for about four years. Um, and I had the same problem about where to, you know, I, I also, I was teaching at Barnard part-time and I was also taking care of my mother and it's very, writing was really important to me and I could not do it at home. I just, it was, it was just no space for it. Um, and it, it's a toll. I mean, it's something, um, it really was a toll on me. And I'm sort of amazed at Minnie Bruce's um, I understand what she's saying about the distance between the creation and the writing and the moments from which these poems sprung and the distance with the actual um, book of poetry, which must feels miles apart. But um, there is a kind of, um, I think, salvage um, and a salvaging quality in being able to turn as much as poetry, you know, there's that famous thing about poetry doesn't make anything happen. There's that famous statement, but as much as it, it's also, it's a, the reverse of it is also true that it makes actually, it sort of keeps us activated in a certain kind of way that I think is really important. I mean, I don't know if this addresses what um, Minnie Bruce has disappeared for some reason. Is she, is she off camera or what's happened? She's lost the connection. Is anybody? Maybe she can See, come right back. Can you in. can you hear me at all? Yeah. 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 There you are. You came right back in. And can you see my video now? Yeah. It's okay. I, I got up and moved because I was afraid it was my connection that was screwing things up, and I lost you briefly. But I heard, I heard Arena. I heard what you said. I could hear you. So anyway, I'm in a different place in the ha in the apartment now. No, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. I, I heard you. I mean, I, I, you did answer my question. You know, it's, um, I, yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, because I mean, I'm going to enter, uh, enter my question into this note, into this conversation where we're at, which is right. Uh, you know, like, wh like what is what it does poetry do? What does poetry not do? Because there's a question and the, uh, the material object, and there's a question about materiality and poetry that's sort of floating in this. And going back to the original impetus, in a way of Alma's question, which is also really related to my question, and your work, Minnie Bruce, with the walk, and it's just to go back and on 
to your work. I actually, I'm going to read a little bit of my question because um, in rereading oh, re Magnified of the many things that I want to do as in, you know, to get you to agree to an interview because I have so many questions, but um, I'm going to ask this uh, sort of more formally, this more formal question I wrote. Um, because it's about like the material, like the in a way, the materiality that is harder to grasp in the poem comes up overlaid onto the walk in some way, I think, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I wrote, of all your work, all your work delights in the details of the quotidian and what is more quotidian than the labored walk of the workers up and down the hill to and from work, working, living in the street, that thank God is this still something. It also points the thickening of that walk over time, age and capitalist time resulting in cement around our feet and muffled feet, which somehow more than writing inscribes life, more than writing inscribes life. Quote, words are not the marks I make walking, which is what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I'm writing an essay on the walk, which as many of you know, it's also really been important to me all through COVID, especially this summer, a long practice for me. So I'm interested to just hear you talk off the top of your head about the walk itself, like the significance of feet and walking up and down streets, the <laughs> elementality of it. Oh my goodness. Um, what a good question about my work in particular, right? Mm -hmm. Because of course I, did a whole book called Walking Back Up Depot Street, right? So I think that um, for me, the walk started first with the fact that I spent most of my childhood barefoot. Mm. And that, I mean, and I mean really seriously barefoot, like from until I went to school, running around without shoes on, this is the deep south it was hot warm so there, you know if I went to church I had to wear shoes but other than that pretty much not I mean walking to town barefoot until I was 12 or 13 like that was when it wasn't okay I was you know going to be a, a pubescent girl so I couldn't walk around barefoot anymore but until then in the summer I didn't wear shoes I mean, anywhere, the pasture down the country, horse shit, nails, we had tetanus shots, right? Because you were walking around in pastures that had tetanus in them, you know, going to go into the chicken yard to like gather eggs. I didn't put on shoes. I walked in the shit and washed my feet off later. Like, so walking started like with direct, contact with the earth for me and I think that was that my feet have never forgotten I can remember when I had to wear shoes so much and this was not until I was a grown person that my little toes got squished I remember mourning just like oh my god that there you know like what this has done to my feet um and then, you know, you can do a whole thing about like what the feet know from going barefoot. And I believe that's true. You know, like that you don't learn if you have to wear shoes from the time you're a baby. There are things you don't know because you haven't been in contact with the ground. I mean, I know how it feels to slide on red clay in the rain. Mm -hmm. My feet know that. And my body knows that. So, I mean, I could say a lot of things, but, you know, I grew up, I'm 75 years old. So I grew up in a small town where people were still walking everywhere, poor people, African-American people, some white people, but mostly poor and black people. And the sides of the road, and this is in, you know, some of a poem somewhere, there was a path beside all the paved roads in my town because people were walking places. A path in the grass down to the dirt because people had to walk to get to work or to where they were cleaning someone's house or whatever. So it's the things that, you know, that, that I'm from a different era, I'm from another era, but there are things I know because of that. 
you know, in my body. And I love um, how what you're describing is, uh, I mean, right, the walk is kind of an experience to be with oneself, but you're also describing a commonness. Yes, yes. Yes, and the walking, I mean, I don't, I don't even know how to, it was part of, and there are a lot of terrible things that happen in the place that I live. M many, many, many terrible things. But it was a country place where certain other things happened because of that. And one of them was because people were walking and moving more slowly, then you had to, if you had to acknowledge each other. If you didn't acknowledge each other, even across boundaries of race, if you didn't acknowledge each other, that was almost like a declaration of war, right? In that town, like if you were a white person and you passed somebody on the path and you didn't acknowledge them who was a black person, then that was danger, danger, you know, because it was a small town and you, again, terrible, terrible things were happening and then there was this other side of it, which was you saw each other, you came face to face, and then other things happened because of that. So all of that's there in the poems, so it's all there. These, in a way, less than some of the others, but these poems, I was just trying to find a little I was just trying to stay in the natural world of life. It's very elemental, but I feel like the walk is one of the elements and that the Absolutely. walk is brought down to the feet. I mean, it, it, much more maybe than walking back up Depot Street, right? It's yeah. the, the feet are really, and the weight of the feet and the weight. I mean, I, I, I also see the illness and aging in that as well, but yeah. 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 I wonder and of course, of course, you know, I mean, if you want to talk about iambic pentameter, we can talk about iambic pentameter and the feet. Oh. Right. <laughs> Seriously. No, yeah. no, I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, I mean, I have a lot of questions about the form of these poems. And um, in particular, one of the things that's really a delight for me, I'm not going to actually ask it as a question because I want to see if anybody else has a question as we're running out of time from the audience, maybe. But I will say one of the delights in terms of feet and iambic pentameter in the form of this poem, and of course you can say whatever you want, <laughs> of course I am asking it, is that um, you do something with lists in this poem that is so elemental and beautiful. And I'm, I haven't really worked my way through all the things I think about it, but um, it, it becomes a beat. These lists become a beat. And they're, you know, oftentimes poets do a list of three things, but they're like two and three and four and five. And they just become like almost the rhythm of particular poems that becomes the beat or the rhythm of those poems in these lists, which I thought was formally really a dynamic. Yeah, I'm not gonna say anything about it because honestly, I did it without knowing I was doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To really continued though what to be continued yes to be continued yeah. yes but i wonder if there is james or zoe are there any questions that came in from the chat or does anybody have one and if not i think we can probably honor our um our time and cheer ourselves or say last things yeah. i can just say that i had questions for you all but i had one for everybody so i don't think we have time so maybe i should just say what they are and and then you can okay. think about them wait i have to go get them i wrote them down hang on One of the things I like about the Zoom is that I can do that. If I were at an actual in-person reading, I couldn't get up and say, wait, everybody, I have to go to this other room and get this thing. I had so many parts. And right before the reading, I had all my parts on the computer. And then I was like, where's Minnie Bruce's book? It was, of course, right here. 
<laughs> okay, so the, these are these are questions I had for the three uh, the three co poets, and and maybe someday we'll all be together and we can talk it all over. So, for Alma, my question was: My generation of lesbian poets were wrestling with the voices that said we couldn't even use the word lesbian in a poem right and so for ama what do you see as the still forbidden areas that you and your generation of queer poets are trying to break through to might be words might be subject matter All right that's for ama for rachel the creation of belladonna that you have been central to still shines. Is there a way that that creation has, or and I'm assuming there is, but is there a way that creation has interacted with how you write poetry? And for Irena, I really hope we're gonna be seeing each other in person so that <laughs> I can talk to you about this and hear your answer anyway. My memory is that the first time, I don't think it was, it might not have been the first time we met, but it was, I remember distinctly talking about poetry with you and it might've been the first time or not, I don't know. But we were actually really, talk, really talking about poetry. And one of us said, I'm trying to write myself out of the past. And the other one, see, I can't remember who said what. Mm -hmm. And the other one said, oh yeah, me too. <laughs> right so I'm wondering where you are now in relation to that in your writing because that conversation must have taken place about 40 years ago because we met in 81 or 2 or 3 or something like that right so I'm really just like trying to know if you've got like well, where I you propose, are <laughs> I propose that we all answer these questions and that we post them on the Belladonna website in some form or another. Oh, that would be wonderful if, you, if you all can do it, yeah. Yeah, I would love to hear Irena's response and Alma's response and I have what to say about my question as well. Yeah, yes. Uh, up with that. It would, it, there would be such an interesting window into shared culture and also divergent lesbian culture. Yeah. People could, and, and I'm seeing in the chat, people are saying, yes, we want to see the answers too. So, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. You've been a great audience, everybody. This was such an honor. And all the pieces, as, as many Bruce said, um, Bill and Ben and James and Zoe, um, Rachel Wilson, um, Irena, Minnie Bruce, Alma, Big love to all of you. Beck, it was great to see you in the in the comments. Sherry. Oh, shout out to Bill from me. Oh my God. And Bill, Bill's been miraculous. Bill did so much and so much beautifully. And these are incredibly, okay. Here's the, what I'm gonna end with. Please buy, well, $12 is nothing for four letterpress gorgeous individually <laughs> designed. No one's ever seen this design before in the universe of design. Broadsides, twelve to twelve hundred dollars fundraiser for Belladonna. If you, if you get to twelve hundred, twelve dollars because we want everyone to have them. But please do buy them, and um, we'll see you again. Thank you. In the middle. Mm -hmm. Love to everyone. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Mm. Mm.